Yep. Hi, Phil. How are you? Good, Zach. How you doing? I'm doing well. So uh, I see you've got a you've got look. It looks like an NFL or an a, a um, hockey hockey NHL. jersey. On. Yeah, NHL. It's, it's a hockey jersey. Yeah, I I collect them. I have no allegiance to any hockey team, but okay. uh, I actually I actually got this one after a uh, program I did on that did a sports presentation on being a Cleveland growing up in Cleveland and a Cleveland sports fan, which means there is no hockey, right? They got minor league hockey, but uh, so I had no allegiance and I was talking to somebody afterwards and he said, well, do you have a St. Louis blues Jersey? I said, no. He said, well, can you wait 15 minutes? Cause I got a bunch of them. I'll give you one. I'm like, sure. <laughs> For a free hockey Jersey. Absolutely. Uh, I've got eight or nine of them. Different nice. Ones. And that was, um, that was a speech that you were giving. Um, so uh, yeah. Yeah. What, was it for uh, Toastmasters or was it for something something else? No, it, it was a Toastmaster friend of mine. It was that is a member of Knights of Columbus. Okay. And he said, "Hey, we do we do programs once a month. Would you like to do a program for us?" And I have a couple of different ones I do. And so I met with him and uh, the the guy who arranges the programs for Knights of Columbus. We had lunch, and the I told the guys, oh, well, this is one you're probably not interested in. I talk about Cleveland sports. And he said, oh, no. You know, I figured in Cincinnati, right, they wouldn't care. He said, no, we have a lot of Cleveland fans in the Knights of Columbus down here. So that was what they wanted me to talk about, was the misery of being a Cleveland sports fan. And <clears throat> I had no problem doing that. <laughs> Plenty of stories. Yeah, except recently. <laughs> Recently, you guys have been doing pretty good up there in Cleveland. Uh, yeah. Except Comparatively. Football, yeah. 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 So you do, um, did you write a book on that or something like that? Am I, am I, I did. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. No, I have, but I've written two books. The first one was called Hard to Believe Land, which Believe Land is what they nicknamed Cleveland. I think about the time that they finally won a championship after, well, 1964, they won football. 1948 was the last time they won in baseball, and they had never won in basketball, but in 2016 mm -hmm. they did. So I, I wrote the book about the 2016 season. The genesis of it was about four years before that. A, a friend of mine who worked in Cincinnati, it, there were three of us, two friends of mine. One of them grew up a Cleveland fan. And, and there's nothing like being in Cincinnati with a fellow miserable Cleveland fan to just, you know, cry on each other's shoulders. And, and so the, the third guy who wasn't a Cleveland fan said, it, it can't be that bad. And I said, no, you don't understand. I, I could probably find a Cleveland sports disappointment for every day of the year. And, and so I started in 2012. It was called On This Day in Cleveland Sports History. And almost every day had some sort of Greek tragedy associated with it, if you went back far enough. So those stories then set against the 2016 season became the book. Okay. And, and the book led to the presentation, which led to the hockey jersey. That's awesome, man. How, how long does it take you to do all of that kind of preparation? And I mean, I've, I've been interested in writing a book before. It's something that's scared me. Mm. Well, yeah. Um, the two I have written have been collections of material that I did over time. So, you know, each day there was a Cleveland sports story. And then I had to put some chapters around it. I'm trying to think. I probably blocked it from my mind. I, I wanted it done by the end of 2016. And I think I hit February 2017. But I would imagine I was working on it fairly hard in the evenings for the better part of 2016, because I'm writing all the, all the, the big stories that go against the little historical things. So I don't know the number of hours. I'd probably be really depressed if I calculated the number of hours versus how much I made on the book. But, but that's not why I did it anyway. It was just, it was fun. It was no, I always wanted to do. I, I wouldn't be depressed if I heard the number of hours I'd be impressed. <laughs> well, but, but, you know, then you calculate dollars per hour and maybe not. Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess. But there's a, <laughs> there's probably things you learned from it too that that, oh, yeah. that were beneficial. Um, not the least of be of it being like dedicating your time to something that you love, right? Um, Getting the project done. Yeah. 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 Learning how to publish on Amazon. That was cool. Oh, are you going to do another book anytime soon? Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm, I'm eating breakfast as we talk. I oh, that's that's okay. Uh, yeah, the the next one I want to do, I'm gonna have to turn around fairly quickly, but it it it's trying to bring. So so let, let me back up for a second. The second book I did was called Great Things Happen Every Day, and that started in 2015 after I had a heart attack, and I started trying to find you know something positive to be to remove stress from my life and i started looking at what good is happening each day and and so that was on facebook every day i put here's the great things that happened yesterday so that became the book but that took four years of collecting great things material and then formatting it into a book and so on so that came out in 2019 so it's kind of the, the two of them come together in that Last year, 2019, uh, you know, the Browns were supposed to be looking like they turned the corner after 20 years of misery, and, and it was great. And so I came home and watched the first game of the season because they were going to be just – they were at home and they were going to beat the Tennessee Titans and get off to the playoffs that we all knew they were going to have. And I watched the first half of the game, and it was miserable, and they were, they were terrible and, and undisciplined. <laughs> And I just turned off the TV and I said, I am not going to watch another Sunday. I'm not going to waste another Sunday watching these guys attempt to play football and lose. And instead, I talked to my wife and I said, let's put together projects we can do on Sunday. And so we called it the Sunday Projects. And each day, each week, we would, find, we would have a project. And so we painted a room. Uh, we reorganized some storage areas. We did some stuff outside. I, I put together a basketball hoop. She finished cornhole boards. And this went on every Sunday throughout the NFL season. All right. Now, the reason I like to put that in a book perspective is it turns out right now we are once again stuck. There's no baseball. There, there's no movies. There's no going out. So what can you do? You know, it, it's like I've been, it's almost like I was given this gift of, of time, right? So what can we do to make use of that time? What kind of projects, improvements, things can you do in your life right now that you, you know, you may never have this opportunity again. Right? We hope we never have an opportunity quite like this again. Yeah. Uh, but given the fact that for the next two to three months, we've got this opportunity, what are the things you can do? And, and, you know, it started with, I don't know, three or four jigsaw puzzles, but I'm over that. <laughs> but, but, you, know, you know, painting, home improvement, whatever, uh, spending time with family. You know, this, is, this has been a big positive in, in my life. Our, our, two, our middle son and our youngest son are still at home. And instead of, you know, they go out or do something every night or, or, or whatever they might want to do, the same things we did when we were that age, they're now at home. So we get to eat banana bread, uh, watch a TV show, all kinds of, of gifts that we wouldn't have gotten had we not been sheltering in place. So that's kind of the idea behind the book and, and talk about some of the projects. I've got to be quick, obviously, because hopefully come July, this is all over. So you're going to also, so you're doing projects around the house and you're also going to try and write a book during this, um, the whole coronavirus quarantine. You're going to try and do that? Would be nice. Yeah. 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 Hopefully I have, it would have to be Kindle, right? Um, because those books are easier to format and publish than when you go to the written book. It, it's a little, it takes, it took me a couple extra weeks. Yeah. And, yeah. and audio books are, are you have to hire somebody who's got the studio that said, they're probably all at home in their studios wait, <laughs> waiting to record them, but <laughs> it, it would be, a, it would be Kindle because you can get those out relatively easy with, yeah. without having to worry about the print formatting. 
Cool. So there's probably, um, you know, I've got similar things going on at my house. Um, we're actually, I'm like terracing the backyard. I just dug, I was out digging this morning. Um, so I'm trying to get, do, do all kinds of things around the house and everything that I, that I needed to do, um, you know, with going to the hardware store as little as possible. Um, but it's a great right. way. I think that, that looking at it in this, in that sense of this is an opportunity to um, work on yourself or to do something that you've always wanted to do. Um, obviously, you know, you got to make lemons out of lemonade. This is not a situation that anybody really wants to be in, but, um, but it's, it's also somewhat of an opportunity, almost like going, like going to jail. <laughs> I mean, some people make it into an opportunity, right? Um, yeah. Exactly. I didn't think of it that way. That's a neat analogy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you also do, you, you do a lot of speaking. Uh, yeah. Do you, um, I'm kind of curious how your preparation is for a big speech because I'm also in Toastmasters. I haven't climbed to quite your level of, uh, of winning, but um, so I'm always curious, how do people prepare um, kind of just to get perspectives for other people who are maybe trying to um, get into that? Sure. All right. So let's, let's talk about how this would be in a normal year first before we talk about how this year works. Because frankly, I don't have much of an idea how it's going to work from here. But, but in a normal year, what I – what I do is I, throughout the year, collect stories. I have, I, I will write them down. I have my four color pen, which is actually part of the speech this year. And just get the notes because things happen and, and they're in the moment, small, insignificant things that you look back on later and say, you know, that story really illustrates a point that I feel very strongly about. And, or, or maybe it doesn't, right? But if you don't collect it, you'll never know. Yeah. If you have the story, and the Toastmasters format specifically is five to seven minutes, no more than seven minutes, 30 seconds for the speech contest. And the way I look at it is the story is about five minutes of the seven. And the story is the easy part, because if you and I are sitting down having a cup of coffee or a beer or whatever, we tell stories and it just flows, right? I can tell you about the time that I, I, I got stung by a wasp or whatever. And, and in five minutes, I don't have to sit there and go, now, what's the next thing I want to say? Because it's a story. So what I have to do then is take that story and put the introduction behind it so I, you get the audience's interest. And hey, have you ever bump a blah? Or what do you think about da 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 da? And, and then you tell the story, and you may or may not step out of the story to make a point at different times. But but five minutes are the story, and then there's the lesson at the end. And that's in a nutshell how you construct that speech. And that sounds really easy, and you know it's not. <clears throat> to find the right things it, because the other thing that might happen is the story is a 10 or 12 minute story and you have to condense it so you don't go over time. And there's also the making sure the story absolutely fits with the point. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I, I have in years past written a story and here's the point. People in the audience are like, that's not the point. That's not the point I got at all. And if that's not the point they're getting, then, the audience is always right. Exactly. Uh, beyond that, I look for ways to add humor. Again, this is in a normal year. We can talk about how it works in an online environment. And I'm, I'm anxious to figure that one out myself. But in a normal year, then you add humor. Because if you, if you say something humorous and the audience laughs, it's, when they go silent, you have to let them go silent. Then you can make your point because they're all tuned in. What is he going to say next? And then you can make that, make a point, deliver the point, and they all get it. Yeah. The other reason I use humor is 
I want to know they're engaged. And if they're laughing, I know they're listening and I know they're with me. And that goes back to, I think my first, my first year of really being serious about the competition was 2011. And I delivered a humorous line right out the gate in one of my speeches and it worked and it clicked and they're laughing. And, and I just was like, this is going to be an awesome six minutes and 30 seconds now because we're laughing. We're having fun. I can tell the rest of the story and they're with me. Yeah. And I have to do that to make sure I know they're with me. Now there is another side of the story that uh, early on, maybe 2004, 2005, I was in a speech contest and I delivered a line 30 seconds in that I thought was just the most hilarious thing in the world. And the audience was either silent or they go, Oh, and, and it was the longest six and a half minutes of my life. So I, I think the other piece of advice there is you got to practice this stuff ahead of time in front yeah. of audiences to know that and, and in hindsight, it was a really dumb joke and it didn't work at all, but, but you have to practice and the audience is always right. You know, so yeah. how often I do you, struggle with that? How often okay. do you practice your speeches? I'm a hundred percent with you. Um, Cause sometimes I'll give a speech and I'll think the point I'll do the same thing. I'll think something's funny or I'll think that the point is here, or I'm saying something brilliant, and people are just scratching their heads, not um, just not understanding. <laughs> but yeah, I had a but, senior uh, vice president. You're oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. go ahead. You can go go for, go for that story. Go. Well, I had a senior vice president years ago that was talking to a room for full of us, and everybody had blank face. And essentially, he said, "What's wrong with you? I get it. What's wrong with all of you? It's like." <laughs> Think about that for one second. <laughs> um, and, and I've had that. It, and you get feedback and people are like, that didn't work. And if I hear it once, I'm like, are you sure? And when I start hearing it from two or three people, I'm like, all right, I'm obvious. I'm wrong. You know, you can't, you can't be the senior vice president and, and say, no, I must be right. And my entire organization is wrong. So, you know, your job is to communicate with the audience. And when they tell you you're not clicking, you need to change. So how often do I practice it? It, as I start to write it, I will practice it and give people, this, this, in Toastmasters, I will tell people, look, this is a speech I am working on. Frankly, I don't even know what the conclusion effectively is yet. I'm going to talk through the story and come up with a conclusion. Partly it's in my head right now. Partly it's just going to be as I tell you the story, I'm going to come up with a conclusion and you're going to help me develop it. All right. So that practice is I need to figure out what's working in this speech and what's not. And I may say it's going to be a 10 minute speech. I know the contest speech is five to seven, but I got 10 minutes of material because I need to figure out what works and what doesn't. And I learned that from Darren LaCroix, who was the world champion in 2001. He said he would give 10 minute speeches to, to hone in the material that works. Number of times, if I go all the way, like I did in 2018 and 2011, and you're talking about all the way to the to the to, to the semifinals. Okay. To the so so the way the contest works is you start out at the club and the area, the division and the district, and, and those are all in the greater Cincinnati area until you get to the district. It can be as far as Charleston, which West Virginia, which is where it is this year. Then in August they have the world championship of public speaking. So they have the semifinals and the finals at an event. In 2011, it was in Las Vegas. In 2018, it was in Chicago. Went to both of those. So what happens is if you win the district in May, and they've changed it a little since then, but we're just gonna play by 2018 rules. If you win the district in May, then you have until August to have two speeches because semifinals are one and the finals has to be a separate speech. So between May and August, you are writing and practicing speeches. And I would imagine, not counting practices at home, the practices at clubs, it was 
in two to three a week. It was, I think, in 2011, it was 40 club visits, roughly. And it was probably that in 2018. And, and then you count the practices at home. And uh, I, Mike Davis, who is my speaking coach, worked with, uh, her name is Sherry Sue, and she was the, she finished second in the world championship in 2018. She said she practiced it about 400 times. I don't, I don't know that she did it 400 times in a club, but she might have. I will go out, you know, we, we have, we live in a wooded area, so I don't have neighbors to disturb. I will go out and give my speech to the trees and the birds because my family gets tired of hearing it after a while. And, and just go, it's, it's one of those things where when you've got the speech down, you need to kind of do the muscle memory when you know when you've written out this is what I want to say then you got to get the muscle memory working so that you say it every time yeah um, friend of mine who Jim yeah. Key he won the 2000 he, he won one of the contests I think oh three he said he would go on a run and and do his speech while running because he figured if he could run in the Texas heat and remember his speech he could remember it at any time I have never gone to that level. I've gone the the closest I've gone to that is in the car. <laughs> I'll I'll sometimes oh, yeah. practice the, them in the car. Yeah. Um, oh, and that used to look that used to look weird. Now people just think you got a hands free mute. Yeah. Or a hands free device, right? Yeah. Oh, he's talking on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I practice in the car. And I don't like to do it, but I do it. I practice it out. I practice it out loud as opposed to in my head. Yeah. It feels awkward. Because you need to hear it. Yeah. Yep. It feels awkward. Um, the other thing is I video all my practices, and then you have to watch them too. Mm -hmm. It's easy to video. It's hard to watch yourself doing the speeches. But I will, I will watch it with no volume to see how my body language and eye contact was. I will watch it with no video to hear how my voice was, did each of the pieces of the speech. And I will then watch the whole program to make sure it all came together. I also sometimes, this actually works well, and I think I did it accidentally the first time. The recording device was closer to the audience than me so I could hear any laughter. It, yeah. it, I just fell into that. Because a lot of times in Toastmasters, you speak to a small crowd when you're practicing. You know, there may mm -hmm. be half a dozen people there. And if you can hear somebody do a small laugh in a speech, because you're not going to get a 10-second belly laugh from six people. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. But if you hear a small laugh in that practice with a room of five or six people, you can about figure that joke is going to work really well when everybody is crowded in and there's 200 people and they're all next to each other. Cause that's when the, the laughter becomes contagious. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I, I'm impressed, dude. That's like almost one practice every week. Um, pretty almost for a year, almost it's same, same yeah, speech. Yeah, or two, but because yeah. I would just, it's tough to have two ready to go, but you have to. But on the other hand, sometimes it's nice to take a break from the one and go to the other mm -hmm. in, the, in those summers. And I had been in Toastmasters since 2001. So I've been in it for 10 years and I had averaged one speech per quarter for a year. So I'd given 40 speeches in Toastmasters to that point in 2011 and then in one summer i did 40 speeches in toastmasters and i said you know another way to look at that is that summer aged me 10 years <laughs> wow have you um so i have found that toastmasters has for sure helped me in my confidence in my articulation um at work as well um has that been the case for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, 
in small settings or in large settings, large presentations, uh, it has helped immensely. And and as it has helped, and as I have gotten to give some smaller setting programs and speeches and whatnot, that then at work I've I had some people that said, "Hey, look, we're having a meeting last year in September. I'm bringing in everybody." from the SAP users group to Memphis, would you give the keynote? And, and it was a blast. So I got to go down to Memphis and give a keynote. And, and then I had just gotten a new boss. So he came in and, and sat in and he must've been impressed. He's keeping me around. Oh, that's good. That's good. Now he, he, uh, he, he I, well, I talk, I talked, again about the four color pen there was part of the program where i talked about what i was doing with a four color pen and in the next team meeting he's like so what color are you writing in right now i'm like oh man i gave you all my secrets man i, <laughs> uh, I don't I, now you gave it to all of toastmasters too so it's not much of a secret anymore i know that's fine that's fine uh Wish so, i was stuck in four color pens now so you work for uh a paper company right? International paper. Yeah. International paper. And you, you yeah. said you were de dealing with the SAP user group. So, um, well, or you were giving a keynote to the SAP user group. There's, um, there's the difference. So what is your, like, what do you, what do you do? Are you in, I, I run projects for the global cellulose fibers group, which is the, Diaper pulp, uh, feminine care products pulp. Uh, if you use Clorox wipes, and apparently everybody does right now, that's that's the pulp that goes into them. We also have pulp that goes into paper applications, but mostly it's all of that. It the global cellulose fibers is about ten percent of international papers business. We have a we have the paper business, and that is somewhere between a quarter and a third of the business now. The big part of international paper is boxes, containers, that kind of thing. Things that food gets shipped in, things that Amazon uses. So from that perspective, it's way better to be in that business and it's way better to be in the diaper business than it is to be in the book paper business, the magazine paper business, or the newsprint business. So I'm kind of glad that our CEOs over the years have changed the focus to boxes and boxes and diapers and boxes of diapers and so oh yeah so you sell the boxes and the the pulp inside the diapers and so there you go you sell to, yep. um is it is it like a to p and g type of thing is yep we sell to procter and gamble kimberly clark uh this is the diaper side the boxes yeah. go to amazon uh well there's i didn't realize i I've never been in the box business. I didn't realize all the things we do with boxes until a, our CEO, Mark Sutton, did a segment on Mad Money. I don't know if you watch Jim Cramer, but Jim Cramer's Mad Money, he interviewed Mark Sutton, and they had the whole stage was just covered with all of the different things we do with boxes. And I'm like, whoa. Yeah, you know, As an employee, I probably should have known all that, but I knew the diaper part. I think that's a powerful visualization um, to see all of the all of the things. I think that that would make a big point on on Kramer. Uh, it, it it did well, and it turns out Kramer's dad was in the paper business. Ah, uh, see, I had um, I went to Miami University in Oxford, and I went okay. through mechanical engineering, but. For a while, they only had paper engineering. It was like a huge thing. So um, I think a few of my contacts or a couple of my people who I work or who I went to school with did maybe paper, paper engineering still or something like that. I forget what exactly it was called. And I think it, one it of them ended paper, up. At, I think it is paper engineering. Yeah, because I, think, I started out at Champion and we recruited heavily from Miami of Ohio for the paper engineering program. Yeah. Yeah, I think a, a few of them ended up with you, <laughs> with your <laughs> maybe one or two ended up with you yeah. guys. Um, that's cool. Um, so, how long have you worked for 
um, that inter international paper? International paper. So I started out of school with Champion and we got purchased by international paper in 2001. So I've been with international paper since 2001 and have been in the paper industry for the entire length of my career. And what do you do on the pulp side of the, the paper of the, of the, um, project, project management. And it's whatever projects we happen to be doing. Sometimes it's like right now we are replacing, well, let me back up for a second. A couple of years ago, we bought warehouser's pulp business. So warehouser wanted to focus into just the forest products business, lumber, that sort of thing. They're a real estate investment trust now. And they had a really good uh, pulp or fi global cellulose fibers business. And we were, I think we were tied for third in the world in that space. Georgia Pacific was number one, Warehouser was two. Well, we bought Warehouser and now we're number one and Georgia Pacific's number two. And so part of that effort has been to <clears throat> take the manufacturing system that they had in the warehouser facilities and replace it with the manufacturing, it, the process information system that we have at Champion. And it's not just a, you know, unplug one and plug the other because it has all the interfaces to all the other systems, the environmental systems, the reporting systems, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess put into that project to kind of herd all the cats and coordinate all of that and we are coming to an end, thankfully, on that project. But it was a cool project because I got to go to a warehouser facility and it turned out to be in Grand Prairie, Alberta, Canada, which was really a, a neat thing to see how the mills work up there. You see frost in September. <laughs> okay, that wasn't so neat. But we, we got on the plane in Calgary and it was 26 degrees and we landed back in Atlanta and it was like 90. But, but it, the, the travel was neat. The other thing that was neat about it was we now have, as a result of the purchase, a, a innovation center out in Federal Way, Washington, which is south of Seattle. And a lot of this system stuff has to be done out there. So I've been able to go out there and, and it's nice to see different areas of the country. It's nice to meet different people and see how, and see how they're thinking about things. And you got to go out there. I mean, not right now, obviously, but you go out there to be face to face and build the relationship so that we can get the system work done. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I do. It's, it, and sometimes it's system work. Uh, in other cases, it was helping the international paper sales group when we started up a new a pulp mill and and get that that qualified because you can't just say hey i've got diaper pulp who wants it you got to test it and qualify it because nobody's going to put it on their baby without all the testing and qualification for nine months or, or whatever it needs to go through and procter and gamble isn't going to buy it from you until it's we have proven that it will work and it is clean and sanitary and so on and so on yeah so it's it's any of those kind of projects and and they're you know, each one is a little different and, and they're all fun. That sounds like very different projects to me because oh, the, yeah. fir the first one that you talked about was a purchase of a company and right. And then, and then after the purchase happened, you're merging the, um, the, the systems that mm -hmm. run the business. Um, right. The second one was completely different. So, um, it, it was, how do you? Yeah. I mean, some of the things it sounds like that you do that kind of are similar is 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 talk to people, figure out how to solve a problem. Um, that kind of sounds like what what you're kind of doing. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah, and it goes back to Toastmasters, right? And mm -hmm. being able to communicate with people and you know, you can't just sit there and say, well, I'm a project manager. Therefore, if I fill out this Microsoft project document, I will have it made. That's not how it works. You can use Microsoft project. I do sometimes, but it's getting out there, actually understanding 
what people want to do, what they want to accomplish with this project, simplifying it down and, and, and having a key message, right? So with any project, it's what does success look like? And I don't want to list this big, right? I want to know, okay, success is, and, and it's easy with the, pro, with, this, with the systems project. The definition of success is easy, right? Success is we turn off the old system and the mill still runs. Okay. With the other one, it was, we are running this mill and selling all the pulp. Okay. So, so everybody gets that one definition and, and then you talk about why we're doing it because if people don't buy that this is why it has to be done, they're not going to help. And, and mm -hmm. then it becomes all of the what's and the who's and the where's and the when's that support that. But, but it's that initial conversations that you have and the, the one with the mill was particularly cool because I was working with the sales group and we have sales group all over the world. So they would come into a, a twice a year, they would have a meeting and it was, it was salespeople and they don't have sales meetings in, at the holiday Inn in Dayton, Ohio, right? They, they tend to have, nicer facilities at nicer locations and, you know frequently a beach is involved and and the people were i mean i was meeting people and i still have friends from south america asia europe uh, africa it, so all of these people are coming in from all around the world and so you know we have a beer or in one case now this is pre-heart attack i don't do this anymore but in one case we actually went out on the beach and smoked cigars and uh, so, so you're, you're making friends, which is really cool. And, and then you're getting the work done. And, you know, you have to make the friends and you have to make the relationships to understand what's important to them. And they understand what's important to you. And then once we've done that, I can call them from around the world. Or they're around the world. And, and we can work on the project. Yeah. That's an important piece because um, I am somewhat interested in in maybe some related things. Have you ever heard of um, the sprint methodology? Sprint, um, mm -hmm. agile sprint sprints. I'm agile, reading a yeah. I'm I'm reading a book called Sprint right now. Um, it talks about a book? lot of good. Called, the book is called Sprint. Yeah. Sprint. Okay. Cool. Um, but it's, it's basically agile methodologies. It's, it's getting everybody in a room and working through projects and you, you start with the end goal in mind. Um, yep. that's the, one of the very first things that you do and you, you know, you go on whiteboards and stuff. However, what I haven't yep. seen in the book is the importance of building relationships, which I, I'm, um, in technical sales and I'll say that relationships are extremely important. Um, yep. So, yeah, that was a good point. I, I think that that's interesting. You, and you, all, yeah. you, you also sounded like you kind of have to sell your product, your project to these people in order to get them to um, kind of work with you. Um, oh, yeah, you, you absolutely do. It, with the salespeople, it wasn't that difficult, right? Because their, their vice president said, you're going to sell this stuff. So at that point, you know, that vice president was a bad guy and I'm just coming in to help. With the new system, it's, it's tough because the people that are supporting the interfaces and all of that have a day job. And they, so we have to kind of convince them, here's why we need to do what we need to do. And they're not under my direct authority. So that's where you have the relationships and you build them and, and I think there's a trial period. I think there was on the, the sales one too. I did, we did three different mills. And on the first one, you know, I had some people I'm like, God, what a jerk, you know, but I think they're testing it. And it wasn't the salespeople as much as some of the other technical people. And there was this one guy and I just, every time I had to call him, I'm like, oh God, he's going to tell me how stupid I am again, Not effectively. And and so toward the end of the project, we're talking, and he goes, 
you know, I'm glad I get to work with you because I finally get to work with somebody who knows what they're doing. I'm like, well, you could have let me know that at some <laughs> point in the last six months. Yeah, yeah. But but you 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 build your relationship. The other thing that <clears throat> I do, and and I had to do it by default the first time I came into a business project involving diapers was you ask stupid questions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't even couch it. Hey, this is going to be a stupid question. It's just like, you know what? If it's a stupid question, it's a stupid question. But I don't understand. And if I don't understand, we're not going to get this done. And my favorite one was we started up this mill and they said, okay, this mill, we have to sell 200,000 tons of product. And we get in a room, I said, is that metric tons? or short tons. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, you have just asked the stupidest question in the world because everybody in the world knows what it's going to be, but you don't. And the person in sales said metric tons and the person in manufacturing said short tons. Yeah. And they looked at each other and they decided that short tons was better because that meant they had to sell 10% fewer to make the mill happy because short tons are about, what, 90% of a metric ton. And yeah. So I, I was like, okay, so I've cut the, I've got us 10% of the way there on day one by asking a stupid question. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, I've, yeah, I've seen that as well, that, um, that this, some of the questions that it's almost like testing the audience in Toastmasters, right? The, right, the, right. The questions may be dumb, but, uh, or your point may be dumb, but if it's a good point to you or a good question to you, um, the chances are it could be dumb, but it could be something that nobody, everybody like disagrees on like metric versus short tons. Like that's something that you'd think is pretty basic. To, yeah. to be fair. I asked one in a project meeting this week that was as soon as they started to answer, I was like, Oh my God, I just asked the dumbest question I've asked in my career. And I said that I said, okay, that was the dumbest question I've ever said in my career. And, I will now turn in my manufacturing card that I know anything about the process. Thank you. <laughs> well, at least you're up front about it. Usually I don't really realize it. And then like I'm digging a hole in my yard in the weekend. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that, <laughs> but I don't know. Um, cool. So, so that sounds like you're actually, you enjoy what you do and that's good. Um, I do. I do. I, I, I will say that, you know, the one impact of this, this COVID-19 thing that I'm not happy about it. There's, there's plenty, right. But the, the big thing is I would travel roughly once a month to a facility uh, or, or someplace and, and travel when your kids are young can be inconvenient, but my youngest is 18 years old. So they're a fairly self-sufficient group. And, you know, my wife can take care of the dogs. And so I would get to go somewhere and, and make a lot of progress. That's the other thing about when you're out at the mill or out at the facility, you've got a lot of focused time to do whatever you need to do. And so I'm missing that. And that, yeah. In the short term, it works. In the short term, I've got the home office. And I've got the ability to do it. And on a day-to-day -day basis, life is not a whole lot different now. Between the hours of, I'm going to say, 11 p.m. and then around to 5 p.m. the next day, life is not a lot different. Mm -hmm. Because it's it, the commute is a lot easier. But beyond that life is not a lot different it's it's in that five to nine or ten space when you know we might be going out to dinner or we might have been going out to get groceries or toastmasters or we might have yeah might have gone to a toastmasters meeting or we might have uh, gone to a scouts meeting i'm a scoutmaster all of that is different mm -hmm. but yeah I, i'm fairly fortunate in that the the world still needs our products yeah and and so therefore they still need my project. So therefore I still have the pile of work. Yeah. And, and in the short run, like I said, I don't need to be at the facilities, so it'll work. 
Have you tried to do anything like, um, have you done any video calls or anything like that? Or have you, how have you tried to kind of, um, so the, some of the face to face is kind of hard to match in this time, but you can get a little closer with things like video calls, like what we're doing. Yeah. Now, I think it's awkward. Though. Yeah. <laughs> and, and kind of being based out of Loveland where most of my, with most of my folks I work on the project are not. I have been familiar with using telepresence and using video calls and things like that. So that that continues. It's been a completely different experience on Toastmasters. I've gone to a couple of Zoom meetings and with with Toastmasters. We I am going to one Monday my time, Tuesday their time with a, a club in New Zealand. I always wanted to, I, I've got a friend of mine in Toastmasters that we met in 2011 and he's in New Zealand and we've maintained a friendship and, and uh, actually got to meet face to face. He finished, it's Kingy Biddle and he finished second in the world in 2013 here in Cincinnati. So we've met face to face a couple of times and I always said, well, I, you know, if I'm ever in New Zealand, I want to go to one of your meetings. Well, uh, virtually I'm going to be in New Zealand on Monday and, and attending their meeting. So that's, that's kind of a cool opportunity. It's, it's different because you know, a zoom meeting is, is from certainly from a speaking perspective is different than speaking in front oh, of a yeah. large audience. Uh, from the audience perspective, it's different a little bit too, but to be, you know, on the other side, it's really cool. And Michael Pope, who's our, He's our division director, I think, right? Uh, and and he works at International Paper as well. He's been going to meetings all around the world using Zoom. You know, I, I see him post on Facebook. I was in a meeting in London and, and one in Poland. And, and so he's really taking advantage of, of this yeah. time and, and getting to use Zoom. It's not perfect. Sometimes the network drags. It, it's as hard as it is to keep a room full of Boy Scouts focused when they're in a room, <laughs> it's even harder with Zoom. And and um, I learned the hard way that I need to have control of the meeting because I didn't the first time. And one of the Scouts came in under a fake name and started putting up pictures and drawing on the screen and I couldn't stop it. So uh, I have become more Zoom proficient since then. Wait, you're talking about a scout meeting. I got, I, I was at first, you're talking about um, a business and then you no. went to scout. But business, I will tell you, it's equally important. I heard a story about a, um, a business meeting with all the management. This was from my manager. And this guy um, turns around in the meeting with his mic and his video on and starts teaching a uh, guitar lesson. And they can't, they, they can't mute him and they can't do anything like, uh, and they had to stop the meeting because he was teaching a guitar, guitar lesson. So that is awesome. <laughs> yeah. You hear about these horror stories where people, you know, go into the bathroom and forget to mute or things like that. And, and yeah, you gotta be real, real careful on these calls. I actually, if I'm not speaking, I will actually mute my phone and mute the meeting. Now, if I get asked a question, there will be a delay to unmute both. But I want to make sure that if a kid walks through the room or something and I say, knock it off, that they don't think I'm telling them to knock it off. Yeah. Or, yeah. or the dogs more, more pointedly or more, more often. Yeah. For, for me, it's uh, the kids as well. Um, I've yeah. got... Yeah. Yeah. I've got kids. So, uh, you do a bunch of your, you do scouts and now you're doing scouts virtually. Um, how has yeah. that, has, how many meetings have you had? Has that, has that been successful? It, it has, it has been, and again, this is something you can do over the short term. Obviously yeah. a lot of boy scouts is going out and camping and, and, you know, being, not within so you know violating social distance because you're all working on a food food together setting up a tent things like that right so over the short term what we have done 
is we have started a couple of merit badges. So merit badges are different activities you have to learn and, and do in detail. And they're, they can cover, I mean, there's hundreds of them. And, and they can cover any number of things. Well, some of them have a lot of work. And one my wife teaches is called Family Life. And can you hear the dogs in the background? Uh, Speaking of Family bad. Life. No, they're, yeah, they're fine. I, I, have um, pre I feel like I'm let into your house. I appreciate it. Like, I feel like I'm sitting, sitting across <laughs> no the table. Problem. And any kind of luck, they'll probably come on camera. Before, uh, <laughs> but they, so family life is one of the merit badges you have to do. And it requires a, like 90 days of tracking, um, honestly, your chores and, and things you do. And it also requires you sitting with your family and having some family meetings. So this is the perfect time where, where we started out with a Zoom meeting to tell the, tell the scouts who need this merit badge, here's what you need to do. You know, you're stuck inside with mom and dad anyway. Have the family meeting, do the family projects, and do this sort of activity, and, and start your 90 days of tracking. And, and we've done that one, or we're doing another one. Uh, we have a, a couple of first responders who are assistant scoutmasters, and they are teaching emergency preparedness, which again, this is the ideal time to have an emergency preparedness plan in place for your house. So uh, giving them some skills that they need and, and getting some, some of the, I, I don't want to call it book work, but some of the non-camping work done right now so that in July or August when we're allowed to get back out and camp, we can focus on that and, and not have to worry about the other things. What got you into uh, being a, a scout leader? Was it your kit or your, my, your kids? Yeah. Uh, let's see. It's a combination of my oldest son and my wife. Uh, my oldest son came home and said, I was never in scouts as a kid. Uh, and my oldest son came home when he was in first grade, maybe, and said, he, hey, uh, they came and talked to us about Boy Scouts and I'd like to join. So we learned about it. And at the time we lived in Westchester and the den meetings were like a block and a half away. So we would walk to the den leader's house and they would do things. And he had a wood shop in the basement and we did that. And then when we moved out to Williamsburg, our second one, was starting scouts and he has a peanut allergy and so my wife said you know we need a den leader and, and she became his den leader because we needed somebody and dens are like time. that's where you um meet together i guess is that correct yeah, yeah, I wasn't yeah you, you have a pack and then each of them have dens i'm sorry so so there's the overall pack which is your overall group of cub scouts okay and then within that you have your your individual dens so you know you have your youngest scouts and then each of the dens progresses so my wife was the den leader for our second son and then when our third son was old enough to join the second son was still in Cub Scouts. My wife was still working with him. And so my third son came up to me and said, Daddy, will you be my den leader? I'm like, How do you say no to that? You don't. So from there, I be I was a den leader until he crossed over into Boy Scouts. So you start out in Cub Scouts, and it, in fifth grade, you cross over into Boy Scouts. And so at that point, I became a Scoutmaster and have been a Scoutmaster since. That's awesome. And all three of them, all three sons, I'm going to brag on them because it was them that did it. All three of them are Eagle Scouts. Wow. Top yeah, yeah. I, I do know that. I had friends that were um, Boy Scouts. Um, yeah. Cool. That's, that's good that you, um, that you, you, you had that experience and that you do things yeah. like that. I, I think it's good to use of your time for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you talked a little bit about your wife. Um, did you and your wife meet at Toastmaster or at, at International Paper? No? Champion. Yes? At huh? Champion. At, at oh, Champion. Champion. Back when I worked Champion. At okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, we, we met and um, got married in 1990. And so we're 30-year anniversary this year. Wow. Wow. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, was that something that was like, uh, not, not kosher? 
or was that something no. that was like it was okay let me let me see how i answer that no that was not something that was not kosher back in 1990 okay. it was it was okay uh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like they had mixers or anything yeah but it wasn't frowned upon because i'm i am thinking of one two three like right off the top of my head five or five or so couples about our age that met at champion I, mm -hmm. I mean it was a it it was a really neat company in that you had to work during the day but then they also had a fitness center where everybody worked mm -hmm. out they had uh, men's golf league women's golf league a, a softball league and, and so you had a lot of you know you you bonded with people right and and you know you come in a lot of us some, some were from the area. My wife was from the area, but a lot of us were not. And, and so, you know, you, you made friends right there. And, and then uh, some of us were lucky enough to meet the love of our life. You were uh, Cle from Cleveland and she's from Cincinnati. Uh, yeah, Marblehead, Ohio, which is uh, okay. uh, about an hour west of there, right on Lake Erie. Cool. Cool. And you fried your chicken? <laughs> I did. I did. Yes, that is one of the speeches. And <laughs> it worked out. It, did that come from the book, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Or did you just no. come up with that? Okay. Because he says that. So that Colonel, book, but... Colonel Sanders, Colonel Sanders fried his chicken. Um, they also oh. said that. Um, so I, I wasn't oh, sure if you, you had uh, gotten that from that book. So he was just I, talking about Colonel Sanders. So I was just reading that book. Well, I never read books. I listen to them, but I was just listening right. to that book. Yeah. Um, no, cool. I probably need to look at it again. It's been a <laughs> long time since I read that book. Maybe subconsciously that was back in there. I don't know. Oh, I think it is the right time to read uh, financial books because um, I mean, it's terrible what's happening. Tons of people have lost their jobs. Um, it's also, that like things are going to be on sale basically soon. Um, that's what he says. So if you have the money, then there's, there could yep. be places for, for investment. Um, Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Phil, do you have, um, do you have any advice for people who are, are coming into um, the workforce trying to go into like the type of thing that you do, like program program management or project project management. Um, do you have any advice for for people other than um, you know making sure to build the relationships? Will you map out the product kind of start or the project kind of start with the end in mind? Are there any kind of certifications that you um, would recommend getting? Um, I don't know, just kind of any kind of general advice. I I have what do they call it project management professional certification and, and that's nice it it gives you a nice way to think about projects um, I would argue the advice that I would give is also the advice I give for what book would you recommend somebody read and the answer is Getting Things Done by David Allen I don't know if you've read the book but it is a really solid read because you've got, a, I think at one point in the book, he calls it this amorphous loop, mass of undoability of, of everything that's hitting you. And it, it's a way to organize your thoughts around, around what needs to be done. And more importantly, in my mind, what does not need to be done. And the one, one thing he talks about with a project that really makes a lot of sense to me is if it has more than one step, it's a project. You know, dinner tonight is a project. Going to a restaurant is a project and you need to break it, it mentally. And, and some people just do this, right? But mentally you need to think about, break it down to the task. Okay, if, theoretically, if a, a restaurant was open right now, okay, which restaurant are we going? Who are we going with? What do we like? And, and, and so you think all that up and it gives you a real good thought for thinking about project management and how it relates to your overall goals it, and that wasn't the purpose of the book but I got a lot around a lot of project thinking 
out of that book. So I recommend that. I rec- my son actually for his senior. Sorry, project. sorry, my wife came in for a second. I'm still listening, getting things done. No, yep. No, no problem. My wife came. Or my wife, your wife came in. Um, okay, hang on just a second. Your, I don't know if you can hear your the dog, son. You were talking know. about your your son. Um, hang on, just. Okay. Okay. Say something now. Yeah. Okay. I can hear you. Perfect. All Perfect. Right. And I can hear you so much better now. Cool. All right. So I completely forgot where we were at. Your oh, project management and my son. So my son's seen. Now you're uh, you're kind of breaking up, unfortunately. Yeah, it says Zoom oh, detected there. a problem with your computer's there. audio and needs to restart. Oh, there it sounds. I I, I don't want it to restart. Oh. Can you still hear me? Can you see my audio? I can still hear you. And um... yes, audio no or no, video. I can I can see your audio or I can see your video now. Yeah, I can hear your audio. Okay. I can see your. Video. All right. Yep. So I'm just going to ignore this little window right over here. Just push it off to the side. So my son's senior project was to spend a day at work with four different people and talk about what they did and recommendations. And he spent the day with me and he said, well, what would you recommend for somebody who wanted to get into project management? And I said, you're going to think this is just targeted at you, but it's not. I said, or what would you look for? I said, if you are an Eagle Scout, that means that you have managed a project from start to finish. And it's been, you know, in, in his case, that was Joe's. Oh, in, in Tom's case, he did a fire pit. He put together a fire pit and benches for the historical society in Williamsburg. And I said, you know, you had to think about all the project and, and how you were going to fund it. And you had to plan that and you had to plan how you're going to build it and what your labor was going to look like. And were you going to, you know, what did you need to be concerned about with safety and keeping people hydrated and, and any number of things I said. So if you want to do it, or if you aren't sure if you want to do it, run a project and it might be in scouts or it might be a, a volunteer project, or it could be in Toastmasters. I know that, uh, they, if you're going all the way to DTM, you have to have, and I'm going to slaughter the name of the, it, it's a, actually, I'm not even going to remember the name, but there's some sort of project you have to do to get there. And, and so you'll see people coordinating uh, an area speech contest or a, or a, a recruiting program or whatever. And it's good to do that because there's, it's a low risk item, right? If you, if you do that in Toastmasters or you do that in Scouts and you say, that was the most miserable time of my life. I cannot stand putting projects together. Then you know it's not for you. And I have met people that I, I jokingly say, if it's a three-step project and we give them the first two, they won't be able to figure it out. And, and, and it's, it's snarky, but it's also, there's, that's just how some people are wired. Some people don't like doing projects. Some people can't think that way. And, and there's ways that they can think that it wouldn't work for me. So, uh, so my advice would be find something low risk, volunteer, some sort of project and see if you like it. And, and if you do, and if you got some talent, there's always room for project managers. We always need more of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point. It, learn by doing is um, yep. always a, a great, great way to learn. Um, and in a low, in a low risk environment. Oh yeah. Right. Hey, there's a job for project manager. I think I'll give it a try. You don't want to do that. And you know, life's too short, right? Yeah. Try, try it out first. Same deal with public speaking, right? I walked mm-hmm. into a Toastmasters meeting and, and said, I'm going to give this a try because Tom Peters said I need, you know, I heard a presentation where he said, oh, you need to check out Toastmasters. And I had actually done a presentation at a conference and I bombed. I just, it was awful. And I, and I didn't have fun. I didn't enjoy it. I said, well, I'm going to give Toastmasters a try and see. And, and it turned out I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 
it, it's so, so many things, um, so many things in my life I've discovered from simply just trying something with an open mind in, in a somewhat low risk scenario. Um, cool, man. And I, I, do you have anything else you want to tell everybody? Um, we are coming up on just over an hour here, I think. Um, so I was kind of curious, do you have anything else you want to kind of, um, go over? I know we talked a lot about your life and I really wanted to say thank you so much for coming on, Phil. Um, that was fun. Like, I really appreciate, um, you coming on here. I think it was a great time, good practice for public speaking, but also, you know, I, I had a good, good time getting to know you. Um, but if you, if you had, do you have anything else you want to, um, to tell, tell the world, tell the audience, I guess. Uh, no. I, oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right, so I don't know what happened with my headphones, but you were, you're saying I appreciate having you on, and then you cut out, so I oh, go back to the phone. Cool. The dogs are outside, so that's fine. A um, hey, couple of couple of thoughts on my mind right now. Uh, if here's a here's a recommended book that has made a big difference for me. I mean, outside of you know, great things happen every day by me. Uh, the a book that has made a difference for me over the last few years. Have you read The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod? Or no. any, it, you don't even need to read the book. He's probably got a TED talk out there. And he talks about how he changed his life by just becoming I mean, by a set of things. And they can be anywhere from an hour to six minutes of, of things that you do in, first thing in the morning to start, set yourself up for success on the day. Because before I read that book, I would crawl out when I crawled out. And, and it kind of helped make me into a morning person. Or, or the alarm would get off. And I'm like, okay, I got to go to work. And, and okay, now. Um, it, but it, the acronym he uses, not to give away too much, is called SAVERS. So he says you start today with a little silent meditation, um, affirmations, visualization, exercise. He said, even if you're going to exercise later in the day, you know, just do some stretches, some, some jumping jacks. Um, R is reading, just a little bit of reading first thing in the morning. And then the last S is scribing because it, it would be W for writing, but there was no word that would fit. Um, I listened to a program of his, 28 minutes, but I've also read the book. And it just makes such a difference if you can start the day first thing, spend some time doing that. And, you know, in the book, he says it can be six minutes, right? A minute worth of exercising, a minute worth of meditation, just real quick, but, but to set your mind right for the rest of the day when all hell breaks loose, for lack of a better term. Um, so I would recommend that. And, and that's something I've been practicing for years and just got back to a more disciplined practice after listening to his audio program this week. Okay. Um, I'll put, I'll put links in the description for, for both. Do you, I'll put your, your books links in the description as well as um, all the books that we kind of talked about. So yeah, the miracle morning is a good one. Um, miracle hey, morning is one my of favorite, yeah. my favorite non, non written by me is still getting things done by David Allen. But those yeah. are two really good ones. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for coming on Phil Barth. Um, Thanks for having me, Zach. Good luck in in the competition if it happens. <laughs> you you too. <laughs> and um, I got a lot of uh, I got a, I had a lot of fun this morning. Have a great rest of the day, man. Me too. You too. and have a good one. All right. Thanks. Bye.